Tank. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we're going to talk about Solitaire and Jez Ball and all those crappy little games that you're probably underestimating. Let's do this. So for all these years, I actually never really had a digital camera. So as a result, I never had a Flickr account or anything. Yeah, I only had a film camera for a long time, and I finally bought a digital camera a year ago, I think? I don't even remember. Well, I remember when I was in middle school, I took $70, and went to service merchandise, and I bought a little 35mm camera. I had one of those Advantix ones with the weird film. I actually have a roll of that film that's undeveloped. I keep forgetting to go develop it. Actually, where I'm going with that is that I found my old service merchandise camera the other day, and I opened it, and there's a half-shot roll of film in it. Whoa, there's probably yeah. good pictures on there. Those pictures are probably from middle school, if My not high school. My pictures are probably from, like, when I was in Israel or something. I'm not sure. Maybe high school. But I pretty much, it wasn't worth it to take pictures because... Developing film was expensive, and then what am I going to do? I have a stack of photographs from my early life. I just, what am I going to do with them? If anything, I'm going to scan them in and throw away the originals. Oh, we were just never big on pictures. I mean, there are probably a lot of pictures of me in family vacations or whatever, somewhere in my parents' house, in some box, you know, but I have a digital camera now, and I just can't remember to take pictures. <laughs> See, I do, because a while ago, Emily, she got a new fancy digital camera, so she gave me her really old one, which... While it's not the best digital camera in the world because it's old, I've never had a digital camera, so it's great. And I got yeah. this tiny little memory card for it because I haven't even bothered to buy a bigger one yet. Yeah. And today, for the first time, I actually used the thing. Yeah, digital cameras are at the point now where like, if you buy a fancy one, it's stupid fancy. And like a normal average one is so much better than any normal person cares about. I mean, who you really need photos to look like super wedding photos that you would pay a thousand dollars for a camera when you could get for a hundred dollars one that is good enough for any normal human being? So, as you all recall, the other week I learned a lot about rock climbing in a short amount of time when I attempted to do some rock climbing one weekend and almost died and almost called 911 because I didn't think I could climb back down and I needed help and all that business, but I got out and I survived. So, today, because I had my camera and I this morning I saw it and I thought. I'm going to start carrying this around everywhere because you never know. I'm just going to keep it in my car and maybe I'll get something to take a picture. Yeah, of. I carry mine around everywhere and I don't use it. Well, I keep thinking to take pictures. So I open up my car and I took a picture of the busted part of my engine and I was just taking pictures of stuff all over. And then on the way home, I took the mountain route and I happened to be driving past the mountain that I almost got stuck on before. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go take pictures of where I got stuck, at, like, from the bottom, and then I'm going to take pictures of all those abandoned buildings around it, and then I'll make a Flickr account and put them up. And one thing led to another, and it was nice out, so instead of just taking those pictures, I ended up climbing the goddamn mountain and taking a bunch of pictures up there, too. Mm-hmm. So, if you, I'm going to link to it, but if you check out my Flickr, there are pictures of me still in my business professional dress from work, because I didn't change, because I didn't expect that I'd be climbing a mountain, having climbed the mountain, and I got some cool shots. It's, uh, it doesn't really look like a mountain to me. It looks like a, a hill. Well, it's Breakneck Ridge. It's, it's, I forget exactly how tall it is. It's like 1,200 feet. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, if you go to my Flickr, which I've had for years, you'll notice that I don't take pictures too often just because I don't remember to. Plus, hill or not, I bet $1,000 you couldn't make it up to the top within two hours. I just use a grappling hook because I'm a not A grappling stupid. hook. Yeah. That actually wouldn't really help at all. I'd throw it. It would grab onto some tree. There's no trees. This is a tree. No, it's There's just trees rocks. in the pictures that you took. Uh, which, some of those pictures, those trees are on the white path you can climb, as opposed to the blue path that is not so much a path, but a sheer cliff. I'm sure it wouldn't be too difficult. If you made it up without any fancy equipment, I could definitely get it. Well, yeah, there. the point is, I don't think you realize what a grappling hook is really useful for, and it wouldn't be useful for climbing that mountain by any stretch. If I could just get a rope hanging down the side, it's all good. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. I don't think you could, even if it was just a straight path, I don't think you could do it. You don't have the stamina. Even so, your uh, your constant trick that you keep thinking is going to work of, say Scott can't do something in order to trick him into doing it, will never work. Well, because lately, after that last game of Kalis, where once again, Rim the Kalis machine dominates, I believe your argument was, I could win, and I could put all that effort in, I just don't want to. That was not quite what I said. What were you saying? I was saying something far more complex that I don't want to uh, I believe into you, now. Okay, <laughs> but suffice to say, the end result of your argument was, I can, I just don't want to. That was not the end result of my argument, but 
My argument was such that I cannot blame you for interpreting it as such. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, in my Flickr, if you're a crazy stalker, you will probably see a lot of odd pictures because I'm probably going to take a good number of pictures every single day. We'll see how that works. And I told myself I'd take a picture every day and I didn't. And you know what? It lasted like a day. So far, I'm betting a thousand. <laughs> yeah, I've added a thousand for a day also. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a few weeks though because you... Uh, you said something. So in the news, John Romero oh God. is in the news. What? I thought he was like just retired or whatever. Well, no, but he's still fairly active. And I've always had a lot of respect for John Romero because despite all the fun people made of him, he him? is. <laughs> despite I all the fun to say it, I'm down. <laughs> that people made of this entity, this entity known as John Romero, <laughs> you can't deny the impact he has had on gaming. No, kind of hard to deny. I mean. One of the first books about the history of gaming was about him, so... Well, the reason he's in the news is there was an interview, and he said a lot of interesting things, but one of the things he said, to simplify greatly, is he basically said that the Xbox 360 and the PS3, that paradigm of console gaming, is doomed to failure. Uh-huh. I got a little, I got a little <laughs> quote here from him. Sure. Right, right now, MMOs, mobile, and PC episodic are really polarizing into the newest, most important segments in gaming. Next gen console is but is big, but the future isn't too bright with the emergence of cheap PC multi core processors and the big change the PC industry will go through during the next five years to accommodate the new multi core centric hardware designs. <gasps> My prediction is that the game console, in the vein of the PS3 and the Xbox 360, is either going to undergo a massive rethink or go away altogether. The Wii has the perfect design for a console that doesn't pretend to be a PC and is geared toward more casual gamers than the hardcore gamers. The hardcore gamers are either going to be playing their new PCs or their new PC-like platform that sits in their living room, but still serves the whole house over Wi-Fi and even video signal. That man can talk in a run-on sentence, I tell you what. Yeah, well, I think the thing he's not realizing is that PS3, whatever, but the Xbox 360 is the PC-like platform in the living room that he's talking about. That's why it killed off PC gaming, because it's basically a PC that you don't have to deal with all the PC bullshit to do. Well, he talks a lot more, and I think part of it just comes down to the Xbox and what makes it popular now is it's doing a lot of things that PCs did a long time ago better yeah it's just more accessible it's easier to play online you don't have to do a bunch of bullshit to set up a voice chat or a video chat or download extra content or patch your games it's like pc gaming that just works and that's but at the why same the time Xbox 360 is kind of cool it's pc gaming that's really limited because once the hardware is out the hardware is not going to advance for a while you've got to develop for the hardware uh well, luckily there's xbox live and all that and theoretically something for the ps3 but it's a lot harder to just make a game and get it on a console than it is to make a game for the PC. Well, that's the thing is the Xbox 360 from a, develop, from a game developer's standpoint is a PC. Mm -hmm. It's no different than making a game for Windows. It, like literally, you can they have a dev kit, the Microsoft XNA dev kit. You make a game and then it builds the game for Windows <laughs> and Xbox in yep. one go. It's now, the same thing. His main argument seems to be that PCs currently partly with this whole intel is kind of busting out with new technology left and right lately and ibm's been busting out and amd has been slashing their prices <laughs> <laughs> yeah <well. laughs> yeah i'm keeping an eye on that situation for everyone because i'm pretty much gonna buy a pc the day the value is like perfect like the perfect equilibrium of chip prices and motherboard prices and ram prices all the stars will just line up and then the moon will make a little eclipse and then up oh, the chips will come out of the fab and we'll buy them yep and then holy <laughs> shit rim's gonna have his first new pc and going on seven seven or eight years god damn I really want a new PC because there's a lot of games I want to play that I wasn't able to play. <laughs> but his argument is that PCs are getting stupidly fast, stupidly quickly. And they're, it's getting to the point where PCs are ever upgradable and infinitely fast while consoles can't, be, can't keep up the same thing if they're still trying to do the same thing the PC does. And I think he thinks that the games that are popular on the Xbox and the PS3 will eventually, just by sheer economics, migrate to PCs, and a console like that, a console that is just a specialized computer, will not be a viable market in the future. Well, I think the only thing I disagree with him on is the fact that he seems to think that p computing power is the limitation 
in game design. Now, sometimes it is. It is. Sometimes but, it is. That is correct. There I mean, I do some, put forth that... Like, in flight simulators, that computing power is the limitation in how good our flight simulators can be. Or Doom 2. Did you ever see the original concept demos of Doom and, and all those games? They're pretty sad. No, no, no. Actually, Doom was going to be a lot more than what Doom actually was. And a lot of things had to be dropped because computers just weren't fast enough. And there was no way to do it back yeah. then. But nowadays... Unless all you care about is graphics. If you're going for a game that is fun and entertaining and will occupy you for a, a long amount of time, you know, graphics are the only real thing that pushes the CPU well, and all the well, other stuff. Well, it, it, not necessarily, because Supreme Commander, while it does push the graphics quite a bit, a lot of the benchmarks and things I see point out that the graphics are a very minor part of its performance. And it pushes the processor just for the yes. sheer data manipulation of all the entities that you're interacting with. That is possible, but that's one case, one oh, yeah, specific yeah. genre. One, you know, what's really holding games back is that we only have a few genres, and we just keep churning out more and more things in those genres without coming up with new stuff. Once Not even while, new stuff. All they'd have to do is there are genres of gaming that have effectively disappeared. Yeah, and yeah. if someone made a game in these genres, and that game was... At, at least in terms of gameplay, as good as the old games, just with updated sound and graphics and plot and things we've learned about gaming in the last decade, it could re-revolutionize the gaming industry, in my opinion. Well, see, what I've noticed, actually, in examining like the history of a lot of, uh, you know, I've lived through this, so I guess I know, uh, you look at any game genre, right? Let's look at the FPS, right? You come out with the brand new genre. The first game in the genre is always amazing. It's like, oh my god, a whole new type of game. Insane. Yep, I mean, everyone Wolf Wolfenstein 3D. People said, what? First person shooter? Hot shit. Right. But then you have this new idea and it's hot shit. People improve upon the idea. You know, you get your Doom 1, your Doom 2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually you reach. The game. The game that sets the standard. Your Half-Life 1. Bam! There's the FPS, Half-Life 1. Some other people make some great FPSs, but pretty much everything after the hot shit game is finally out is just, eh, whatever. That's why Counter-Strike is still number one. I mean, FPSs to, that are out today are so much better than Counter-Strike. I mean, you cannot deny. However, there's nothing wrong with Counter-Strike. It was the first game in the FPS genre so, to say, all right, there's nothing wrong with it anymore. So if I've got a game that satisfies my desire to play in a genre, that's, that 90% satisfies my desire, and it 90% satisfies everyone else's desire, so everyone's playing it. If a new game comes out that satisfies it 92%, mm -hmm. how many people are going to abandon all they've been doing to try something new and stick with something new? Yep, the same thing happened with like... Uh, uh, well, MMOs. Games. Look at MMOs. MMOs. There, That's there also was, another one. There was one MMO, and then there were two, and I played and them back then. they were all then. crappy, and EverQuest was crappy. Well, they were all fun. They, yeah. They but, just, they, they were good, but they weren't good enough to get a complete market share, a complete mind share, and they kept coming, and there were more and more, and EverQuest got really popular, but then another game, and every time a new game came, people would migrate bit by bit, and the old ones would just slowly die. And then World of Warcraft came, and while it's definitely not the perfect MMO, yeah, you, it, it passed the threshold. The threshold of the majority of people who want to play an MMO are going to play this one game. Yep, RTSs, you had War Warcraft 1, blah, 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 StarCraft. After StarCraft, oh, that's, that's it. That's the game. Well, I don't know. Supreme Commander, I'm really excited about. I really want to play it. Yeah, I'm not saying that you can't make a better game, but generally in any one genre, oh, no, you, I mean, you I'm sort of reach a game, and that's... That's, that's as far as that's going to go. You know, well, everyone who comes after, you might improve, you might improve a lot, but it's mostly just knockoffs here and there. Just yeah. trying to rehash with slight improvements. Well, like, look, XCOM, Mission UFO, which is lauded by a lot of people, including experts, as one of the greatest PC games ever made. Look at all the sequels. They were all basically the same. I mean, Terror from the Deep, XCOM 2, was the exact same game, reskinned slightly so, yeah, with so worse graphics. What's the limitation in games, I think, is not that you don't have enough power to make the game you want, you know, except, of course, for VR-type games and games that plug into your brain and all that shit. Or that's, Supreme Command. Yeah, that's a completely different thing. But the idea that you have to need... You can either come up with a new genre of gaming and then bring it up to, you know, its maximum game, or you can find a genre that was never fully developed, like Star Control. Star Control 2, you might say that was the one, but I don't think that genre was taken all the way. Well, there's also that the, you could have a confluence of ideas. 
where you take two things that could be integrated to make something that is more than the two things by themselves. Yeah. And I do agree that the PC has the potential to be the system where it's at, mostly because, unlike consoles, anyone and their mother can make a PC game. Yep. You know, Furthermore, no one has to. No one can tell you you can't make a PC game. While the PS3 and the Xbox and even the Wii have where you can get stuff online to play on your machine, it's not really like the PC where there's no limit at all to what you can get online. Yeah. And PCs are infinitely extensible. I mean, if you make a PC game that needs a peripheral, like a joystick, people are going to buy the joystick. And they did back in the day. And if games that needed joysticks came back, there'd be joysticks again. Yeah. But... If you make a game for a console and it needs some special thing and that thing didn't come with the console, no one's going to play your game. Your game's just going to be this niche game forever and never expand. Well, I don't know. That's uh, A lot of Guitar Heroes are being sold. I wouldn't say that too quickly. Well, Guitar Heroes and DDR and all those games, I think, are an exception. Because uh, it's not well, like it's not that, like that mech that game. game. The, the mech, mech game. The me a lot of people bought that mech game. Scarily enough, but it was not a big as, seller. Yeah, but not as many people. It didn't become this huge game, and then it slowly petered out fairly quickly. And I played the game, and in my opinion, it was rubbish. But yeah, I don't think it was a very good game overall. But it did sell a hell of a lot. I mean, it didn't sell as much as Guitar Hero. But think but. about it. it: when it came out, right, and then the months afterward, at RIT, which is like a center of gaming, and all these geeks. There were like five people who had that. Yeah, it's pretty good. Most games sell almost nothing, so that's, that's a pretty good selling game. Anyway, my point is is that because the PC, you, anyone can make a game for it, the future and hope of PC gaming is if people go out and make games in brand new genres that are like no other games we've ever seen. You know, like Katamari was and like uh, what other games recently? Like uh, all the games that... Uh, Introversion software is making the Darwinia uplink guys. Um, that's that's the hope of PC gaming right there, and not more chips. Effectively, the hope of PC gaming is Steam right now. <laughs> well, Steam is just a distribution platform. Yes, for... but the whole idea, I think, that now on PCs you can have a distribution model that entirely eliminates anything physical. On the Xbox, no matter how much you download from Xbox Live, Xbox games are still going to be a disc that you go to yep. the store and you buy. Or you go to Amazon and you buy, and it comes and you keep it around. On a PC, I mean, look, most of the gaming stores around here in downstate New York, they don't have PC gaming sections. They don't even bother. Yet, PC games still sell. People still buy Steam games. Just They just do it online. Why go to a store? Why even have the store? There's no reason to sell a box for a PC game anymore. Yeah, it just goes hand in hand with the... People can, anyone can make a PC game, but that won't help you if it's not easy to sell a PC game. And breaking the barrier to entry where anyone can sell a PC game and distribute it by Steam or equivalent is what is necessary. If PC games were still mostly sold in stores, then it wouldn't matter if someone out there made an awesome brand new PC game in a new exciting genre because they wouldn't be able to get it out there. But yeah, this interview is pretty short and it's kind of interesting, so check it out. All right, so yesterday on the Virtual Console, you know what game came out? What game came One out? One of my favorite games ever. Uh, Custer's Revenge? No. It was Galaga, the sequel to Galaxian and one of the best space shooty games ever. I've gotten to, like, level 60-something in Galaga one time. God. I was never good at Galaga, but I, any kind of space shooter, I'm just ass at. I'll have to do a little how-to on Galaga. It'll take, like, five minutes. Well, take it's not a very complex game. You do a Galaga how-to, and I'll do a, I don't know, Bionic Commando or Zookeeper. Bionic Commando is a little more complex than Galaga. Oh, Zookeeper. I set the high score at Katsukan on Zookeeper. <laughs> yeah. Or Bar ta Root Beer Tapper. Yeah, yeah. So, Galaga. It came out on the Wii yesterday, but I didn't get a chance to play Wii yesterday. I was busy. And I was, I said to myself, all right, for five bucks, I'll buy it tomorrow because I really like Galaga. I'll buy yeah. it. In fact, he said while I was editing the show, we just finished up and he's like, hey, I'm going to go buy this right now. And then he didn't. Well, I didn't buy Galaga and I was planning to buy it today when I got home, but I haven't bought it. Why is that? Why, why didn't I buy the Galaga that I said I was going to buy? Am I just a shit talker? I think you are. And you're dumb. No, I'm actually very, very smart. You see, because today a news came out. Oh, I see. You ready for this news? The I'm new ready. Namco Museum confirmed for DS. DS. Yes. DS. There's going this summer. Namco is going to release a DS game, one DS cartridge that will contain all of the following. Are you ready? Galaga. Ta-da. All right, sold. <laughs> Galaxian. All right. 
Bonus. Zevius. No, uh, I actually really like Zevius. Zevius is kind of bad. I don't really <laughs> like want it. I'm bad at these games, <laughs> so I like the bad ones. What do you want from me? Mappy. <laughs> Wait, you mean Mappy Land? I think so. With the little mouse? I think so. That game was it badass. It just says Mappy, M-A-P-P-Y. All right, if that's actually Mappy Land. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tower of Druaga. Uh, I've heard of that, but I don't really know about it. Uh, Dig Dug 2. Ooh. I'm all, I have the Dig Dug 2 NES cartridge downstairs, but I haven't played that game in a long time. And that is sort of this long lost game, Dig Dug 2. Because you didn't really dig down, you dug sideways and you broke up this island into pieces. It's and... almost as good as the original Dig Dug. Yeah, it's it's actually really similar, but it's kind of weird and it's a game not many people know about. Pac-Man 1. All right. And Pac-Man Verse. Oh. oh. See, Pac-Man Verse is a game for the the uh, GameCube. Basically, you... you could buy this game for the GameCube and it came with some other Bullshit Pac-Man game. <laughs> well, no, you, there was basically... It was weird how they originally released this game because you couldn't buy it on its own. It would always come with another game. So if you wanted it, you had to like buy our racing revolution for GameCube and it would come with Pac-Man first. Or you would buy... This the game crap, that shall not be mentioned. The game that shall not be mentioned. Perhaps then, the worst game ever it, made. Yeah, it came with Pac-Man Verse. So, but Pac-Man Verse is really the game you wanted. See, now Pac-Man Verse to me was this revolutionary thing because it's this little game. It's a game that you couldn't sell as a full price game. No, it's, you could sell it for five bucks, man. It's basically just a small mini game on a, a little GameCube disc. The thing is, what it was is a perfectly, wonderfully executed multiplayer Pac-Man that used, that so rarely used, connected GBA to the GameCube functionality. Where one guy just plays Pac-Man, but the other three people... They're the ghosts, but they can only see a little area around So them. one guy's playing Pac-Man on his GBA that's connected to the GameCube, and the other three people are looking at the TV trying to catch the Pac-Man who's playing on the SP. Yep. Now, if you catch Pac-Man, you become Pac-Man and get a bunch of points. And you and trade controllers. You give him your GameCube controller, and he gives you the SP or the GBA. This starts to break using. down after about an hour unless you have wave birds. Yeah. If you don't have <laughs> wave birds, the cables get all jumbled up, and you have to untwist them after a while. But, but it's really awesome and if it's on the ds oh shit oh, because i gotta say when we got this game we played this pac-man game for hours and hours and hours at almost every opportunity for yep. quite some time i it think is it's actually gonna be better on the ds because you eliminate the problem of ghosts looking at each other's areas ah oh, but that's a creek a key key part of the strategy <laughs> and you also eliminate the swapping of controllers and things well, now think about this pac-man verse on the game uh, on the ds right Imagine if there was a, game, a DS cartridge that was just Pac-Man first. I'd pay 30 bucks for it. Guess would, how would... much this Namco Museum is going to cost. How much, Scott? $20. Wait a minute. I would have paid 20 bucks for all those other games except this Pac-Man. I would have paid 30 bucks just for the Pac-Man. Hot shit. Wait a minute, but think about this, right? 20 bucks for eight games. The Galaga on the Virtual Console was $5. Basically... It costs twice as much if you buy it on the Virtual Console than if you buy it on the DS. Well, and the DS One is better because, f first of all, you're getting a physical thing, whereas on the Virtual Console you're not getting any. But didn't we just thing. say that that's bad? Well, yeah. Anyway, but at the same time, it's a portable one. A portable one is better than it. it's not like well, Galaga the is going to be any worse on the DS than it is on the Wii. The one argument I could make would be that well, the one on the DS. You can't play it on your big screen. It's Galaga. <laughs> See, here's the thing. Galaga is so low resolution. We can talk about the Wii and the GameCube and the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360, but the fact remains that far and away, by an order of magnitude, forever, the most, the best most awesome, most popular, most selling, most perfect console in the world is the Nintendo DS. The DS is kicking all sorts of ass. What, like 25 million? I don't it's, know, man. The Nintendo DS. All I know is that I look at the Amazon order I just put in. I ordered Pokemon Red and Green. That way we can get the old Pokemon and our new Pokemon, Diamond and Pearl. Because we've never played Pokemon. <laughs> no, and I that's didn't. GBA and DS, which are all being played on the DS. And I ordered Super Paper Mario. So, so far, that's two to one or four to one, however you want to measure it. <laughs> See, the DS, when it came out, Nintendo was really worried about it not succeeding. I mean, it was even, they kept making up this line of, 
yeah, it's the third pillar. We're not getting rid of the Game Boy. This is the third thing. <laughs> and that way, if it failed, they could just kind of, you know, it didn't fail. It's serving its purpose. Well, that's what they did with the uh, the Virtual Boy because the Game Boy was out and the SNES was out and the Virtual Boy came and then it fails. So they just put it away. <laughs> it didn't just fail. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it catastrophically failed. Actually, the funny thing is, despite how poorly it did, I know like seven people who had one. I only played one at Toys R Us. I never knew anyone. I played who, one at my I know people now who own them, but I never knew anyone who owned one back in the day. Oh, no, but all the people I know now who own one, owned one back in the day. They bought it, like, when it came out. Yeah, Katsu says he has one or had yeah, one. My friend Adam in high school had one that he really liked, except he hurt his neck trying to play it. Yeah, the only good games for it were, like, Wario something. Tennis. And Mario Tennis. Oh, Mario Tennis. And the space shooting game. It, had wasn't three, that, it basically had three games. Wasn't that the first Mario Tennis? I think it was the first Mario Tennis. Anyway... The DS is the best console, and to the, I mean, it's, I use it as a primary console. I was the first handheld where I would sit in my own house. It wasn't just, oh, it's a portable system. It's, I'm going to sit in my house, in my living room, in my video rocker, in front of my TV, playing a DS. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I don't really worry about Nintendo, because they're laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> Things of the day. So I normally lately been trying to avoid just doing something that was on or near the top of dig recently. And I saw this link. I kept seeing it to, oh my God, this really hard hack of the Mario one ROM. Oh my God. It's impossible. Yeah, I noticed, LOL. I noticely happens a lot lately. It's like, Hey, did you see this? And it's like, I would see the link, but I didn't care to click on it. And then you'll actually click on it, and then I'll see it. Or vice versa, because half the time you do that to me. You're like, Rem, did you see the crazy guy going nuts? I'm like, what crazy guy? Oh, I saw the link to that. And then... Yeah, I keep seeing the link to that. I keep reading the headline. I didn't read the story. Read well, the story. I decided to watch this one because I was in my room uploading to Flickr, and that took a while. Even though I, found, I searched for uh, Flickr on the repository in Ubuntu, and I found exactly one program. You can use FSpot. Oh, because I just used uh, K Flickr. I uh, use F Spot. K Flickr is actually really nice. F Spot is really nice now. I'll try it, but K Flickr was really nice. Because what F Spot does, uh, forget it. It's well, not well, for it does it <laughs> All right. So I click on this thing, and it starts, and Mario just falls to his death immediately. He starts in the air. <laughs> and basically, th this is a 22 minute video of a human being who is a very good Mario 1 player. Probably, I'd say, a top 100 in the world. He's, he's better than me, that's for sure. This guy is one of those people who could like do a speedrun of Mario 1 and 99% of the time win with a decent time. Like, remember the, the first well, the first speedrun that was all over the internet, that Mario 3 one where he kept bouncing on the bombs? Oh, that was tight. Yeah, this guy is as good as that guy. Well, that guy did it with a tool. I know, but that's not this the is, point. Yeah, but this isn't a tool. This is a human. Yes. It's obvious it's a human. Now, the thing is, this is the hardest Mario ever made. It is specifically designed to be as absolutely impossible as possible while still being possible to be one. <laughs> well, I don't think that there's any mathematical proof that this is definitely the hardest that Mario can possibly be. Oh, true. There might be one slightly harder. However, however this is fucking hard. It, now, you can't really... The guy it was doesn't matter. The guy was given infinite lives, and you got don't you have to watch the whole thing. Watch like the first five or ten minutes, because it's basically he dies. All right, start over. He dies. All right, start over. He gets to like the first little bit, and he jumps to the second bit, and you see this fucking blooper there. You're like, oh no, and then he dies, and it is going, it's going fine, and then eventually there's one point where he gets past something, and you're like, hot shit, he's gonna make it. And then he runs, and there's this gap, and there's a pipe on the other end. He runs, he jumps to get to the pipe before the flame hits him. There's an invisible fucking block at the exact perfect fucking spot, and he hits it and goes right into the pit and dies. I'll, I'll spoil one more thing from the video. Oh, the pipe? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you're playing a Mario game. Your first instinct is, hey, a pipe I've never seen before. Let me try to go down it, right? Especially in a game like this where yes. every, like, now, you're getting fucked at every turn. If you can skip even yep. two panels of this, it's great. Yep. I had seen this video enough because this is like a minute in maybe. I don't know. And I had seen enough of this video to know that this game was going to pull every trick in the book to just kill you if you fucked up at all. And he, as soon as he started ducking on that pipe, I'm like... 
That pipe's just going to drop him into a hole. And sure enough. <laughs> <laughs> the best part is the pipe drops him into a hole, right? But there's still coins in there, and there's still an exit. <laughs> he even got some of the coins, I think. But there's... <laughs> Now, I wish I would pay a lot of money to have a dual video where one side of the screen is the Mario, and the other side of the screen is the dude playing this. They must have had, like, a giant bucket of NES controllers because he uses to smash them on every single play. This video is fascinating, and yet... It feels just as bad as watching that video of the guy who goes nuts in the elevator. <laughs> Where every time he dies, I'm just like, ah, ah. I felt just like I had done it and I had died. And it's the worst part hard. is, you can see he starts getting pissed off. Because toward the end, he starts dying on the same trick like over and over again. Uh, and it's just... <laughs> now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil one thing at the end so you won't hate me. You don't have to watch to the end because he doesn't fucking make it. He gets like a quarter of the way through the second part. Yeah, he, he beats, he eventually does beat 1-1, but he doesn't beat 1-2. He just keeps dying and then gives up. And that's the video's over. Yeah, so pretty much after he beats 1-1, just look at 1-2 for like a second yeah, and then turn the video Don't off. bother actually sitting there watching this video because there's no climax or ending. It doesn't go anywhere. He just if dies anything, and gives up. If you're a gamer, this video is going to be wonderful and hilarious, and yet it's going to piss you off. <laughs> All right. So while we're talking about different genres of games, there uh, there's a genre of game that not many people know about other than super nerds. And that genre is roguelikes. No. <laughs> it's it's kind of funny because, you know, what do you call Doom? What genre is Doom in? It's, it's an FPS. It's a first-person shooter. You know, what genre is Half-Life? It's also a first-person shooter. Imagine if you called Quake... A Doom-like, or a Wolfenstein-like. Granted, there were Doom-likes. There were a lot of games that ripped off Doom. But no Doom one called out. them Doom-likes. They nah. called them FPSs. Plus, this isn't like... <laughs> you just... don't call Sonic the Hedgehog a Mario-like. And this isn't like someone just... Well, I guess the Great Giana Sisters is a Mario-like. <laughs> it is but... <laughs> definitely is a Mario-like, but you don't call it that. You call it a platform. Now, imagine if this was a semi-legitimate genre where pretty much everyone who knew about it called it that. Yes, there was a game called Rogue a long time ago, and it was basically an ASCII game. Don't play it. It's Don't not, play it. It's I, not... I like it only because it's cool to like it, and I tried to play it, and I got really into it for like an hour. And it's... in that hour, I learned that I can't get very far without dying. Yeah. Basically, you're a little at symbol, and you use the arrows on your keyboard to move around a map, which is made of dots and lines and slashes and all the different characters that you can possibly type in ASCII. Don't be fooled. This is one of the most complex fucking games ever. Oh, it's stupidly complex. There's like every button on the keyboard is a different command, like dig or jump or search or pick up. You have an inventory. You have levels. You have stats. It's in a ludicrously complex game Grant, it's not as with the most primitive interface possible. It's not as bad as that stupid dwarf whatever game. Remember that? Oh, God. That thing? Oh, God. No, don't talk about that. So, yeah, that's a game called Rogue. And... If you want to play a game like Rogue nowadays, NetHack is pretty much the standard. That's that's the game people play. It's open source. It's free. You can just get a copy of NetHack and play it, and then you'll know what Rogue games are like. Roguelikes are like. Yes, they're like, like Rogue. Like, they're like. also like NetHack, because NetHack is a roguelike. Anyway, what if somebody made a roguelike game that was also like... Another kind of game. What kind of game? Because uh, Scott didn't really tell me what he was looking at here for this thing of the day. And then he said, come here. And I come over and he showed me something that surprised me and filled me with a small amount of awe and respect. <laughs> what if you took, say, I don't know, Zelda and made it roguelike, but still Zelda? And the end result is something that you probably not going to actually want to play more than a few seconds. But the fact that the game works and is a real game is amazing. And it's surprising that this game is, like, in every way, this is a roguelike game, except it has music. <laughs> Pretty good music, actually. Well, and it's it's completely skinned and themed. Yeah. As far as ASCII can be skinned and themed. <laughs> as far as ASCII can be skinned. But you turn it on, and you know it's a Zelda game. It is, it is, they've taken the ASCII character set, and they've completely, it's Zelda, through and through, 100%. This is definitely proof that minimalist ideas in gaming, that if you're designing a game, I mean, it, I'm not saying that games have to be minimalist, in fact, far from it, but at its core, at the very core of any game, is a very simple concept, and that concept can be readily identified by gamers. Yes, and... Well, it's not just Zelda roguelike. They got a Metroid roguelike. 
and a Castlevania roguelike. Bad asses. So if you know Zelda, Metroid, and Castlevania, I suggest you go and, like, for just a couple of minutes, learn, like, the basics of playing a game like NetHacker Rogue, and then play these things so that you can get the joke and be like, oh. Because if you just go straight to these without playing a roguelike game that's not one of these three, you're not really going to get why it's awesome. Now, I'm going to warn you, because there is a... It's most like much like Ghost in the Shell, where there was that brain virus that affects like one percent of the population and then some small percentage of those people if they see the certain thing gets triggered by it roguelike games are like that you might be one of those people who back in the day would have spent all of college playing rogue and nethack and then eventually starved to death yes roguelike games are sort of weird in that you either most people don't like them but a small subset of people love them to death like, we knew a couple people at RIT who played these games a lot. And they were just addicted to NetHack. They played NetHack all the goddamn time. Just constantly. So, if you play NetHack or any of these games for more than about an hour, uh, turn it off and post in our forums and we'll get you some help. Or admit that you're one of those people and just start playing every roguelike game you can find. Because yeah, there, there are a lot of them out there and if you like them, you will not be an unhappy person. Also, I know that because it's basically free to play these games and you can run them on a fucking 386. You could run them on like a 286 if you can install like an old like Linux kernel on there. So theoretically, you could work day like one-off jobs you know just what? enough to buy food. People have Linux running on just about fucking everything these days, right? Why don't they compile NetHack for like the DS, which runs Linux, or the iPod, which runs Linux? Or Well, I guess you need more buttons. But that's not the point. It could be done. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think there's a great overlap between DS players and roguelike <laughs> players. Yeah. So anyway, speaking of minimalist games, tonight we're going to talk about something that may shock you. We're going to talk about solitaire. Well, not just solitaire, but all the sorts of simple, casual video games that Everyone and their mother plays. Really, yeah. my mother plays these. This is about all she plays. I mean, games like Diner Dash and Bookworm and Free Cell and Solitaire and uh, Jazz Ball. Random Flash games. Like, my mom, you know what game my mom plays more than anything? It's the weirdest thing. It's a Flash game on some website, and all it does is it shows you a bunch of letters, right? It'll give you, like, seven letters. And then it says, okay... Spell every word that can be spelled using these letters. So you have to spell every one letter word, every two letter word, every three letter word that can be spelled using that set of, of letters. And once you get them all, you're done. And my mom plays that game a lot. Like, she'll play it every day. Well, the thing is, a lot of gamers, well, a lot of, I guess, hardcore or too cool for school gamers, really dismiss these games, despite the fact that a lot of people play them for one. Well, I don't think it's that people, they dismiss them. Well, they it's dismiss... It's that they just don't even really recognize or pay attention to them. It's like, you think, okay, you know, what percentage of the population is are gamers? And you think, okay, well, let's see. There's this many teenage boys out there, and I know a lot of 20 and 30-year-olds are still playing games, and there's this percentage of old men, and, you know, there's these many girls out there with DSs, and you, you come up with, like, the stereotypical answer. But really... A shit ton of people play video games. The most popular video games are like Tetris on the cell phone, uh, you know, uh, all Boggle. sorts of Boggle. Boggle on the internet. Boggle on, you know, Backgammon on Yahoo Games, Hearts on Yahoo Games. Hearts, Euchre, Cribbage Bridge. Those things are stupidly popular. Yeah, I mean, they're not actually video games originally, but they're in video game form now. And you know what? Those freaking count. And a lot of them mom, are straight up like Diner Dash, which was stupidly popular, yeah. was uh, just a flash game. I mean, if your grandpa doesn't has never played a video game in his life, but he plays party poker, guess what? That That's a video game. He, he's, now, a, granted, he's a gamer. Your grandpa's a gamer if he plays party poker. Granted, you can still make the distinction because there is a difference between someone who plays games and someone who self-identifies as a gamer. There is, of course, yes. However, people just don't seem to count, gamers at least, don't seem to count people playing normal casual games that everyone plays as being a video game player. Now, why is this interesting? Well, one, here's another little known fact. These games, 
is where all the money is. Yeah. You, you can make so much more money making some stupid little flash game, putting it on the internet with a little ad, or maybe a link to pay five bucks to download the full version, than you ever will making the next Morrowind or Oblivion or whatever. Yeah, think about this. Let's say you're, I don't know, you're, you're a PC game company, and you make... The new hot FPS. It's the hottest FPS. It's it's smashing, right? You sell millions of copies for oh uh, forty bucks each, right? And then you d- split that money up among your developers, and it costs you millions of dollars to make the game in the first place. And you, the publisher takes a cut, and all these people take a cut. You still and you make pay a profit. For the hardware and the servers. You still make a smashing profit. However. You're well, not one, really going to be rolling in it. You're you just going to be a, getting by. Well, mostly like the issue jam. is you had a really high initial investment, mm-hmm. a really high one, and a chance of failure, and a chance of very high losses if the game fails. And while you make a lot of money, the margins are a lot narrower than you might think. Meanwhile, you can get one guy like me to sit down for a week, crank out a Tetris-ish puzzly game for a cell phone, once it's on that cell phone network, say, I don't know, uh, let's see, how many people have cell phones? Just everyone. everyone. And they, you know, they charge like a dollar or whatever to well, download. They charge like 250 so 250 times, I don't know, 2 million people, and it costs you 100 bucks to make the game. Ching! And there's a lot of these games, and you might not realize it, especially if you're a cool, leak hip, too cool for school, I said that twice, gamer. I don't know like why that's, I don't know why that's in my head lately, but... Those games are out there, and a lot of people are playing them. More people are playing those games than are playing your Halo. Yeah, it's kind of scary. Or your God of War. Any any game self respecting gamer doesn't really care about cell phone games, you know. And any any smart person, as far as I would say, wouldn't buy a cell phone game because they're horrendously overpriced. I and mean, they're also usually you might pretty as well shit. Buy game virtual consoles almost a better deal than cell phone games. <laughs> the way they price those things. Some of them you even have to pay monthly for the cell phone games. It's like, you want to keep Tetris on your phone? Pay $3 a month. And I'm like, fuck no. <laughs> I'm not paying $3 a month for a crappy Tetris. I got Tetris DS, bitches. My cell phone, because I got this a long time ago, and yep. I'm loath to upgrade because it works pretty well, and the battery lasts forever, but it came with the probably the second worst Pac-Man port the world has ever seen. So it's worse than the Atari one? Well, second worst, because... <laughs> Atari, well, I guess Atari 7800 Pac-Man is good. Well, but. Atari 7800 Ms. Pac-Man is straight up Ms. Pac-Man. It is. However, Atari 2600 Pac-Man... Notoriously bad. ...was an abortion. <laughs> now, all right, so one day, I ended up stuck somewhere without my DS and without any form of entertainment whatsoever, and I was so bored that I... Turned on my cell phone, I started playing this horrible ass Pac Man that barely worked. I beat the first level. Then it said, 250 to buy the next few levels. And I said, Ah! Ah! <laughs> and I deleted it. Yeah. And then I sat there. Now imagine stewing. how many stupid people pay that, and imagine how much money you could make if you made that game and it was pre installed on all those phones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, another See, interesting thing is that. Solitaire is probably the most well-known of these games because it was really, for, I'd say, a lot of people. In fact, I might even posit the majority of human beings the first PC game they ever played. Yeah, I'd say for most human beings out there, Solitaire might be the first if PC game If not Solitaire, ever then that whole genre of Solitaire and or Free Cell. Free Cell, uh, what's the other one? Spider. Some people were freaking badass at Spider. I can't play that game. Yeah. I'm th- here's Mind the thing. Sweeper. When I was a little kid, I played the Solitaire Mind on the computer. Sweeper. Because I was always, yeah, it might be Mind Sweeper too. It's hard to say. But then mm-hmm. again, I think most people who aren't gamers went for the Solitaire first because they knew what that was. Yeah. And they didn't know what that Mind Sweeper it took was. Me, you know how it took me like a couple days to learn how to play Mind Sweeper? <laughs> I figured it out okay, kind of. Right away. And then one day, like the third time... Because I was time, not... If I read the help, I would have learned sooner, but I refused to read the help. The third time I played it, I was like... I, like, I was looking at those numbers. I'm like, what the hell are those numbers again? And then I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, this game's stupid. No, I, Minesweeper's awesome. I love Minesweeper. I basically... The only problem I have with Minesweeper is that, you know, occasionally it comes down to you have to take a risk, and it's just random whether you're going to win or lose. And if it doesn't come down to that then all you are doing is as a human being executing an algorithm very slowly. 
Uh, or very quickly, if you're very good at it. I once beat a simple Minesweeper in seven seconds. I've beaten a simple Minesweeper in five seconds because it was so easy. There was just like three bombs and I yeah, got Yeah, every night you get lucky, like all the bombs are just in one spot. Just like, click. Yeah. <laughs> Do you get them all? The worst is like, there'll be a corner, right? And there'll just be three bombs surrounding the corner. And you don't know if the corner has a bomb in it or not. And you might or may not have to click it. But here's what pissed me off to no end. When I was a little kid, I loved card games, but I never, ever played solitaire because I just I didn't like it. And I thought it was dumb. So finally, I was bored and I had a computer and I was doing everything on the computer. So I learned how to play solitaire and I was playing it. And I'm good at normal card games, but I'd lose at solitaire sometimes. And it bothered me a lot. Sometimes you just can't win. And then one day my dad walks by and he sees me sitting there and I'm like, I, I, I don't think I can win. I don't know what to do. I feel stupid. My dad's just like, oh, that one's unwinnable. And yep. I'm like, unwinnable? You mean that this, pot, that this game is set up to where you might just be fucked from the start? And he says, yeah, that's why I don't play solitaire. Yeah, it's, solitaire is basically just well, well, Klondike a way to solitaire. Waste. You realize that solitaire, there are like a thousand different solitaires. Well, I mean, technically that game where you jump the pieces over each other and then, you know, and trying to remove them all except one from the, the plus-shaped board, that's the that's a game that's actually just called solitaire. Well, uh, see, people call a lot of different things solitaire, but the one on Windows is, I believe, Klondike solitaire. Yes. There is, are is. a lot better solitaires out there. There are many. I think Free Cell, at least, is definitely better than Free Cell's okay. Yeah. But Solitaire is basically just a game where if you have a deck of cards, you can exercise your brain in a very slight way to pass the time. Now, That's here's all what, Solitaire is for. Now, interesting thing that a lot of the people I work on computers for or I work with are not technological like me. They're doctors or they're lawyers or things like that. And I usually show up to save the day or fix the problem or install the new switches in the closet so they can get faster internet or whatever. And... The most common request I get after, can you uncensor the stupid internet for me? God damn. Which <laughs> the answer is always, no, I can't even uncensor it for myself. <laughs> but right after that is, can you put solitaire back? Because my company takes solitaire and Minesweeper off of all the computers. <laughs> and everyone asks for it back. People download spyware-ridden solitaires on the internet because they just need their fix. <laughs> wow. But two, a lot of people don't realize the reason... Solitaire was put in Windows originally. Well, there were actually two reasons, one of which is a much bigger reason than the other. See, yes. When Microsoft Windows 3.0 came out, people had been using DOS. People had been using God knows what until then. You know? People didn't know. I mean, there was Mac -o Macintosh, but really, you know, Macintosh was something else. It, Most it, people did not know how to use a mouse or... They just were bad at it. And I, I'd watch yeah. people, young people, not even like parents or grandparents, who just couldn't understand the concept of click and drag or just anything. Like, like what's that for? This is a big deal. I mean, the first copy of Microsoft Word ever, the first version, came with a computer mouse, which is something that no one had. Everyone had a computer with a keyboard, nothing else. They might have heard old jokes about... Maybe they about, had a joystick before they had a mouse. You might have heard old jokes about people who thought the mouse was a foot pedal. That wasn't a fucking joke. They're, 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 that really happened more than once. Yeah, I mean, nowadays, the mouse is a standard peripheral to the computer. I mean, imagine if... God, to me, my mouse is literally... Well, I guess not literally, but it is, as far as I can tell, an extension of my brain and body. It is a force of will. It is, it is an extension of all that I am. It yeah. is part of me when I'm using But imagine if new PCs started coming with a new peripheral that came out with, with a, I don't know, a Wiimote. And you didn't let people, you know, people had never seen this before. You just hang all someone with this All the computers started coming with them. People aren't going to know what to do with them, and they're going to be all weirded out. So, Microsoft made Solitaire, which funnily is enough, you can play it with the keyboard if you know what you're doing. And my cousin would always play with the keyboard because it was faster. But you could play Solitaire with the mouse. It was intuitive to play with the mouse. And it taught people how to double click, how to click and drag, how to click one time. It taught you how to do all the basic mouse skills, how to move the mouse with precision, and, you know, it's something people wanted to do, and you basically tricked them into getting comfortable and learning how to use a mouse on a computer without having to say, you know, here, use the boring learn to use a mouse program that no one cares about. And In that's a word? probably solely responsible. Without solitaire, mouse, computer mice wouldn't be widespread today. We, computers, who knows, maybe, I don't know. It would be a scary world. In a word, it was brilliant. Now, the other thing 
that solitaire, the purpose that is served, that was also equally important, and I'm sure it was on the minds of the people who decided to put it in, was that compared to previous computers people had had, solitaire showed off what a Windows computer could do. You're dragging stuff around the screen. There's graphics that you're dragging around in your computer, not in some program, it's in Windows, in a window. And also, when you beat Solitaire, there was this, for the time, fancy graphical show where all the cards bounced off the screen one by one, and people would sit there transfixed. Yeah, it was pretty amazing when you actually saw it. I mean, there were card games on computers before that, but they were nothing like Solitaire. Plus, like, Solitaire people, actually looked like cards. Plus, people didn't know how to play them, and this is right when PCs in the home started becoming actually prevalent, and not just this weird thing that like one or two some people, people had. had but not everyone yeah now it was it was becoming to where almost everyone had a computer or was planning to get a computer it was really kind of a yeah. the beginning of the computer it in wasn't the home until revolution. the mid to late 90s when it started to be everyone has a computer and everyone has a similar computer as opposed to hey those people have a commodore and those people have a ps1 and most people have nothing you know this was everyone's got a computer with windows 3.1 oh shit that might have been a little short, even though the show went on a little long. I know we ranted a lot about a lot of things, but the fact remains, don't discount or ignore the simple crap games, because those are the bread and butter of the, the world gaming industry right now. Yeah, your video game magazines and your video game blogs pretty much don't pay attention to this stuff at all. You know, I mean, if Yahoo Games suddenly upgrades their chess or their hearts or their spades, no one's going to really pay attention. But Well, granted, Xbox, and log Xbox in, Live has Uno, and that's making all sorts of is. waves. But if you log into Yahoo Games, there are thousands of people playing hearts right now. Shit, in fact, that's more than a lot of MMOs. Yeah, and you know what? I really like hearts. I really so. like hearts, too. I've played a lot of hearts on Yahoo Games. I've played a lot of backgammon on Yahoo Games. Yeah, actually, Scott and I are both really fucking good at hearts. I'm about as good as at hearts as I can be. Yeah. Granted, then <laughs> Not as anyone can be, but as I can be. Yeah, well, then there's people like my father who, God, to this day, <laughs> I can't beat him. Yeah. yeah. And also, this, because I know a lot of you, you're young and idealistic and you want to get into the video game industry, pretty much the best way to get into the video game industry, at least to start, is to develop these crap little flash games and these crap little Java games and these crap little games for some little company trying to advertise something. Yeah, if you really want to learn how to be, you know, there are a lot of ways into the game industry, be it by art, testing, direction, uh, management, programming, but if you want to get into programming video games, start out by making yourself like a Tetris in Python. It's actually really easy. You can do it in very few lines. Yeah, code, and if, if you, you know want to, but if you want to make money while you're learning all this, get a job for some little developer who's making some little game to promote his little thing, and he'll pay you some money. Yeah. Make and flash games and make cell phone games, and you can live a happy life. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>